And you really saw, I mean, you, you saw the effects of that yesterday because the inability to picture, frankly, a group of white people overrunning the Capitol is a lack of acquaintance with American history in and of itself. Hello, and welcome to Why Is This Happening with me, your host, Chris Hayes. You know, here on With Pod, we like, I like having this podcast as a kind of um, a place that is apart in some ways from the news cycle. Sometimes we're sort of closer to it. Sometimes we're very far from it. We're doing, you know, like last week's <laughs> discussion of bourbon, um, which I love because obviously my other job, one of my other jobs, which is hosting All In with Chris Hayes, APM Weeknights on MSNBC, is extremely tied to the news cycle. And yet, I think as you'll see in this podcast, there are times when what's happening feels so overwhelming that it's weird to talk about anything else. So, you know, that that happened, I think, during there was a period during the the initial COVID lockdown where, you know, we were just living and breathing COVID and, and COVID stories all the time. We were doing them on the podcast. And, you know, right now I'm talking to you on January 7th. It is one day after a armed, violent, insurrectionist mob overran the Capitol after being incited quite directly by the President of the United States in order to achieve the purpose of blocking the certification of the democratic election of the next president and to try to interrupt or forestall the peaceful transfer of power from a government that had lost an election and had been rejected by the people. There's not really a great, I mean, I think all of us are struggling a little bit with what to do with what we saw yesterday in this sense, what to, like, it's not the most important debate in the world, what to call it. (laughs) Uh, I don't really care. It's extremely bad, extremely dangerous, but what it what it means what it means about where this country is and what this country is and the stories we tell ourselves about what this country is what it means about american democracy and its fragility its recentness which i think is a really important theme and and what it means about where we go from here as we head towards the inauguration of joe biden and a, a democratic senate which uh, you know we <laughs> No one, you know, I remember spending, uh, it feels like eons ago, I think it was after the Georgia race had was clear, like just sort of digesting the improbably good news that there would be a, a, you know, Democrats would have a chance to get some stuff done and confirm some nominees and staff the government and all this stuff. And then that quickly gave way to the the insurrection. And so we'd, we'd plan another conversation, which we're still going to have. But as this was all happening, I was uh, texting with my my good friend Tanahasi Coates, um, who is a very busy man and uh, who had been wanting to get on the podcast, he's like, "All right, it's time. We got <laughs> we got to talk about what the hell is happening right now." You probably know who Tanahasi Coates is. He's uh, won every award in the book. A writer, a thinker. Uh, he works on everything from essays to novels to comic books to screenplays. And I've known Tanahasi for. I don't know, over a decade now and have been in kind of dialogue with him through, I think, both of our careers as as writers and, and, and public thinkers. And I always come away from our conversations with a lot more clarity. So, ta it's great to have you on the program. Thanks for having me, Chris. Pleasure to be here. I guess first, like, as you watched what unfolded yesterday, there's a bunch of different things to process, but I'm just curious what you were thinking as you watched it. Um, you know, uh, I think it's, you know, what I, what I told you on the text. It, it, this is, um, look, if, if, if um, you believe that Barack Obama was not a legitimate president, um, that he was a, uh, some sort of, you know, Muslim Kenyan uh, sleeper, um, you then have to believe that you suffered uh, under eight years of a stolen uh, presidency um, recently. Uh, if you believe that Hillary Clinton was either the head of or somehow involved uh, in, in, in a cult uh, that, you know, specialized or exalted in uh, child uh, pornography and came within, you know, uh, a hair's breadth of inhabiting the White House, um, 
that'd be pretty scary. Uh, if you believe that only, you know, a uh, 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 mere weeks ago, uh, the presidency was outright stolen, that there was a plot that spanned across states um, that was of such a level of sophistication that, that somehow uh, the votes for uh, the president were fraudulent and yet for other people on the ballot, they were not. If you believe that you are facing an enemy that is somehow capable of that, um, then the actions yesterday are correct. Mm. I, 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 I don't know what, what else one would expect. And, and, you know, these are not, you know, as I told you, these are not fringe positions. You know, um, these are the positions, you know, uh, of people that are actually or were actually working in the very house that got invaded yesterday. <laughs> yeah. And in some cases, they're just majority Republican. I mean, but birtherism was a majority Republican position. I mean, the, yesterday after that happened, a majority of Republican House members voted <laughs> to block the elect the seating of electors. So then what? I mean, what? It, it, either the election is being stolen or it's not. You know, either, you know, we suffered under eight years of an illegitimate president or, or, or we did not, you know. Um, and so I, I don't understand how people who either, you know, trade in these lies at the minimum um, advance them, you know, in, in, in other cases can somehow uh, be surprised or condemn uh, the actions yesterday. If what um, a significant portion of the Republican Party and its leader, by the way, leader, and leadership, yes. it's a leader, says is true, then a coup d'etat is the correct action. Right. I, I don't know why it wouldn't be justified. So I, I, I don't know how on the one hand, you know, you, you condemn the actions of, of, of the crowd yesterday and then, you know, <laughs> you know on the other hand, uh, uh, support everything we've been told about, about, you know, the election and elections pass up until now. Yeah, it's a great point that, like, if, if the premises are true, which is that the election was stolen... Stolen, stolen, <laughs> fraudulently stolen by a conspir a cabal of shadowy forces that have wrenched away the rightful winner and replaced it with the loser, which again is actually trying to happen in the opposite direction. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, I'm I mean, who says go sit it, go sit at home and let it happen again? <laughs> like, well, that's the thing. Like the thing I was thinking. So here's the thing I was thinking. I was like. What I one thought I had yesterday was to run the thought experiment the other direction, which is this. Like, let's say, let's say Trump pulled it off. Let's say that enough, you know, that that um, enough state officials cooperated, or he had majorities in both houses that would do it, where he basically was able to knock out electors. And, you know, with whether through just sheer majority votes in both houses that seat electors that were, you know, th these sort of alternate slates, these ridiculous, you know, sham electors, like, let's say he would pulled it off. What would the proper response of like anti-Trump forces be to that? Like, I, I, you shouldn't I, you shouldn't draw your gun on the Capitol, but there should be millions of people in millions of people in the street for sure. Like, well, you know what I mean? well, like, well, the thing is, the thing is you have to compound it though, Chris, you have to compound it. I mean, because the, the Republican party line is not just that one election was stolen. It's that one election was stolen. The last one was almost stolen. And at the eight years, there's not been a legit, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Democratic candidate in 12 years. It is that the opposition party is totally illegitimate and is in the hands of shadowy, unseen forces you know um i i don't know what the basis of a non-violent response is at that point right um i, I don't think non-violence is something you just sort of say because it sounds nice i mean it 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 it, it, it rests on very real grounds violence is horrible you know uh, oftentimes people who you know you, you you consider to be most deserving are not the people who often suffer um it is it is a spirit that you know is 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 very you know rarely that one is very rarely able to control. There are yep. there are all sorts of you know great reasons for now, but it's not a thing you just say because you know what I mean. You know, I mean you know and, there there are reasons for that. And, and it's also the case that like I mean one thing that was interesting is that, and I, this is something that 
you've written about and I, I wrote about in, in the second book, Colony of the Nations, it's like, you know, today I see Rush Limbaugh talking about violence and about how, well, thank goodness that nonviolence wasn't the path that Thomas Paine chose and, and, and the, you know, the founders. And yesterday, a lot of 1776, you know, references and a lot of Gadsden flags, uh, the don't tread on me flags. And it's like, they're, they are right in a sense, which they is are. like, they are. the nation was very much founded on violence. It was founded on like violent insurrection. And, you know, we don't study this part of the the founding, but it was unruly mob violence a lot of times. I mean, it was like custom British customs officials being dragged through the streets and tarred and feathered and beaten beaten to death as crowds cheered on. Like it it was real gnarly. Right. So, you know, I, I do think there's just this weird one of the things that was so crazy to me yesterday was, and one of the things I found really difficult is there is such a buy-in to this sort of American exceptionalism about our special distinctness. Even on even on the wrong factual grounds, like people saying, like, you know, our judiciary is independent. It's like, yeah, <laughs> there are independent judiciaries like all over the OECD. Like, what do you, what do you think liberal democracy is? Like, we're not the only liberal democracy in the world. <laughs> that, 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 that people will like cite things about the American system that are like so special and distinct. And it's like, there's literally dozens of countries that have those features. Like, I don't, what are you talking about? But you just saw yesterday this sort of failure, a failure to reckon with what the actual history of the country is. And as you mm. said, like what it would mean mm. to believe the premises that are being sold people mm. all kind of papered over with this, like, well, that doesn't happen here. And this is not what we do here. And, mm -hmm. and, and there's part of that that I think is, is actually laudatory and noble. Like it's aspirational to say like for the political class to come together and to, you know, as one condemn what happened, that's correct. <laughs> but it also just felt so detached from the reality of what we're seeing unfold before our eyes. The problem is I think there are significant, like as a, as a political, as a piece of political rhetoric, um, as a, you know, as you said, an aspirational sort of thing that you, you say to yourself, you know, it's the kind of thing you say to a football team at halftime. Right. Um, it makes sense. It makes sense. But I strongly, strongly suspect um, that a disturbing number of people, not just, you know, regular Americans, but people in leadership actually believe it. Um, it. I'm not convinced that, for instance, when Barack Obama would say that, that he was, you know, feeding a line. I'm not convinced that Joe Biden is feeding a line. I, I, I'm just not, you know, and I, and I say that, you know, obviously I differ with that, but I, but I think like then you have to have a, a very, very different argument, which is that it is not simply that ordinary American citizens haven't reckoned with the history. It's that you're in the hands of leadership um, who haven't quite reckoned with the history. And you really saw, as you, as you just pointed out, I mean, you, you, you saw the effects of that yesterday because the inability to picture Frankly, a group of white people overrunning the Capitol um, is a lack of acquaintance with American history in and of itself. Um, you, you know, Chris, you said something when you were doing the intro that I just I really, really think, you know, we should zero in on. And that is the newness of American democracy, the recentness of, you know, American democracy. And I just um, if you'll allow me here, I think yeah, it's please. worth just disentangling this for a second. So you're talking about, you know, until 1865, um, you have large, huge, huge swaths of the country that, that is basically written out of citizenship altogether, 40% of the Southern states. Um, it is not simply that, you know, 40% uh, of people in the Southern states are written out. It is that uh, the laws and, and, and the Constitution are, are written in such a way that it actually favors the people who are slaveholders at that particular time. A disproportionate number of the first presidents are, are actual slaveholders. Uh, if you look at you know who was holding office and where they were, who was in the Supreme Court, who was appointing the people in, in the Supreme Court, it, it favored slaveholders. So it's not just that it was, you know, we start off from a basis of, of anti-democracy. It's that the anti-democrats actually hold disproportionate power, as one would argue they might, right. you know, today. After 1865, what do you, you have a, you know, a, a, a century? In which African Americans, again, at least in the South, you know, are, are written out of history. This is to say nothing of half the population not being able to vote um, until uh, until you, you know, you're granted women's suffrage. And the problem is, we are building a country during that entire period. 
You know, and I, I, you know, we get into this debate about the New Deal a lot, but I don't think the point is that the New Deal was a bad thing, but it wasn't created in a democratic and in, in an egalitarian democratic environment. You know, it was made possible by wiping out nearly half the population of, of the southern states. You know, um, you would not have a solid South without that. And so, if if, if you start in, uh, you know, I don't know, sometime in the nineteen sixties. You know, Voting Rights Act, I guess you can take it from there if, if, if you wanted to. And even then, you were talking about still a kind of chancy democracy because they're vestige, vestiges right. of the anti-democratic spirit. Felon disenfranchisement, by the way. People think this came up during the period of, 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 of you, know, the, the, you know, the crime bill. It didn't. You know, it's a vestige of, of redemption. It was founded as a tool to disenfranchise black people. And in many states, it's still on the book. So you are talking about roughly 40, 50 years? Right. Dur dur during which you can say you have democracy, but even then it's challenged. It's a fight. It's not a fact. It's not a state. It's a fight that's being had. It's a process. And so, you know, this, this picture that we paint of ourselves as this oldest democracy hallowed institutions, et cetera, you know, it, it really doesn't match. And if you understand that, if you understand that this isn't, you know, the first attempted coup in American history, I mean, have been successful coups in American history. There were all through, as you know, Chris, during the period of redemption, if you grapple with uh, massive resistance in Virginia, why is this shocking? Right. I mean, the way to tell the story <laughs> to me that sort of synthesizes these is that like, both it's the yin the yin and the yang right of of american history and i think you know frederick douglas had an incredible vision of this and du bois i mean both of them right like that an aspirational vision that sometimes is ascendant and sometimes made real through whether it's the 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 union victory and the subsequent occupation of the south and the radical republicans with their supermajority you know putting through congressional reconstruction for a period in which you had actual you know um ed education literacy public works for african americans in the south and and citizenship and voting rights which was then squashed by violent insurrection essentially like there are moments of this really elevated incredible aspirational democratic widening that happens and then there's retrenchment and the two forces fight each other you know with not with one side guaranteed to win at, at any moment or in any sort of like destined way sometimes one side wins sometimes the other in the long arc i you know we've gotten we have widened the circle of democratic enfranchisement to the point where like for the last 50 years, we're like, I would say a real democracy in our modern terms, even it, but that, as you said, like that's contested and constrained. And so, you know, I mean, even take it this way, the, like the person that won more votes didn't get to be president last time around right. and the party, that won right. fewer votes has, has right. won the president. Like, and that's just like, that's, that's and appointed three Supreme court justices, appointed three point Supreme court justices. Employees. Like, yeah. you know, the Senate, like there are all these, you know, there's all these ways in which we're fighting uphill against these kind of my minoritarian institutions. So to see, to see what happened yesterday when the Capitals overrun, where they say this question of like, who will rule, right? And, and who is a citizen and who you will allow to be in citizenship with, it's the oldest question in the country. And it's always contested. And so, right, yeah, like yesterday was an example of that. But then at the same time, it's like, that shit was wild. Like, I've never yeah. seen anything. Yeah. Like, I also just sort of think, I, I think we all have a hard time processing what we saw because like so much of the Trump era, it was both goofy and terrifying at the same time. Yeah, but you know, you know, uh, our good friend Jelani Cobb <laughs> uses an example. Hippopotamuses look goofy. They kill people, too. <laughs> exactly. They kill people, man. Well, and Jamel Bowie had a great, you know, Jamel had a great thread today where he's like, you know, people saying this is cosplay or LARPing, right? Mm. Like role play. He's like, what do you think the clan was? What do you think the red shirts were? Right. That's what, like <laughs> they, they had their stupid <laughs> costumes and their stupid catchphrases and their stupid passwords and their stupid little rituals. And they thought they like and then they like actually successfully terrorized the South into restoring That's white right. supremacy. 
That's right. That's right. I, I, I just want to push you on something, and I want to offer actually a, a note of optimism, weirdly enough, even as I push. Um, I, it is the yin and the yang, but I would argue that there's been a little bit more yang than there's been yin uh, in American history, or a little bit more yin than yang, however you want to you know, take it, because you know, the period that we draw hope from really... Uh, is you know this this period that you would say after the Voting Rights Act and you know that that period of of, of Reconstruction, um, boy, we have a lot of anti-democratic history in this country, yeah. just just a lot, and we've done a lot. Now, at the same time, I think you're kind of correct because one of the things that I think uh, we should always be clear about, you know, even as we um, uh, uh, talk about the, the the force and the power of white supremacy, it is fundamentally a minoritarian ideology. And it always was. That's actually not yeah, a, a, a new point. thing. You know, we think this happened because old folks looked up and saw the demographics and then suddenly, no, 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 it always was. There was a civil war. <laughs> That's right. Because it was a minoritarian yep. ideology. You, you know, it, it, it's not even the case. Uh, and this is why that the borders are contested so violently and so brutally. It, it was never the case that they could get 100 percent of white people. Great that was point. always the problem in the South. If they could, they'd be fine. Right. They'd be fine, but there was always tension even yep. among white people, you know, over this, which again is why, you know, we had a civil war in the in, in, in the first place. So um you, you you are correct. I mean, this is always, always challenged. I mean, this period of of you know uh reconstruction that we admire, that that Wilmington government that was overthrown, it's a fusion government. Yeah. It looked like Joe Biden's presidency. That's what it looked like. Yep. You know, and so um, this has always been a minoritarian, uh, anti-democratic uh, movement. It, that's that's a really good point, and I think also important in terms of placing the current moment in history, which is that like, because there does end up being, you know, this is a theme I come back to again a lot on the podcast. I think because we have the space for it, of just like we just have a tendency because because race is so central correctly and because demographics are so central correctly and because multiracial pluralistic democracy is such a contested thing, th there just end up always being a lot of like shortcuts that we take in our terminology about bl blocks of voters and black people and white people and things like this. And like, it's always contested, <laughs> like among the polity in a million different ways. Like as, as, as Wright Thompson was saying last week on the, on the program, like Kentucky was a union state. That's right. You know what I mean? Like right. West Virginia exists because it was a union state. Like now that's not to say that the the white people of those states uh, were, you know, uh, committed to the cause of right. white right. and black equality. But it is to say, like, there's complexity and con contestation in a million different directions about what the democracy will be and who it will be for among white people stretching all the way back. Because as it turns out, um, the requirements of. Uh, retaining a white supremacist government is not just, you know, I really don't like black people. You actually got to do quite a bit more. Yep. Um, it, it was not enough that, you know, one be in the South and say, you know, um, I, I don't really like slavery, but I would never get in your way of holding. Say, Abraham Lincoln tried that. <laughs> You know, it's not enough to be tolerant, you know, of, of bigotry. You, you actually have to do active things. I mean, there were, you know, slave states where, you know, it was compulsory to serve on, on the patrol. So, you know, it, it, it's, you know, it, it is not as if um, there is one side in which, you know, folks are just openly, you know, bigoted and, and racist. And this other side where you have, you know, these, these racial egalitarians, white supremacy requires things of white people. Yeah. And there has always been a significant number of white people who, however they feel about black people, just don't feel like doing that. Right. Just it's don't feel like doing that. Well, and it's also, I mean, that that speaks to kind of these dueling vanguardisms, too. Because, I mean, one of the things I thought yesterday, I, I had this weird, you know, the first thought I had yesterday morning when I watched what was happening. First, I was, you know, I was taking in the, the Georgia victories, which were, the Georgia Senate victories were genuinely shocking to me. I have to say, like. Yeah. I, I yeah. think partly out of it's remarkable. It, it is remarkable, and it's remarkable because structurally, there's no way the Democrats should win those seats. Just you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 the the deck is stacked very hard against them, and the fact they won them both. And again, like Martin Luther King Sr. took over the church as pastor that 
Ebenezer Baptist Church that, that mm. Raphael Warnock is the pastor. Mm. In 1927, mm. when people were getting lynched, and his son would then share it with him, and his son would have his mm. funeral there after being assassinated. Mm. And like the guy who's the pastor of that is going to go to the U.S. Senate as the first black senator directly elected, elevated to the seat through the election of the people in the old confederacy. Mm. It's incredible. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful and it's incredible. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at that. And then I'm looking at and I'm thinking like, man, come through, Georgia. Like, that's amazing. It's amazing what happened to these. And, and, and a Jewish man, too. Like, the old yeah. civil rights coalition sort of embodied in these twin figures. I thought they both ran great races. I thought they both refused to be, like, cowed. I thought they did a really good job of not getting on their back heels when, you know, they ran negative oppo dumps. About, and I thought Ossoff actually played a crucial role in this, who ran behind Warnock. So Warnock, in some ways, was the... But 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 Ossoff, the, the two of them standing together... I thought was so key. Like they, they, they tried to do this thing of like, what about this sermon? He said this, and here's this scary black man. And then they would go to John Ossoff and be like, well, what about, and he just absolutely refused it. You know, just thinking about that, that Warnock Ossoff race, I, I, you know, what I, what I love and I hesitate to heap praise on Stacey Abrams because it feels like everybody's doing it and it's getting into this dehumanizing sort of thing. So I don't want to Did you see that tweet that. about like the challenge is to talk about Stacey oh Abrams. It doesn't make you sound like the dad from Get Out. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it just, you get a little, there's a little, you know, you, but at the same time, at the same time, one should not allow people's over exuberance yeah. and you know even fetish fetishization to keep you from saying the truth and the truth as far as i'm concerned is she had this remarkable ability to at once not be naive about what you know w was being faced in georgia to not pretend as though you know voter disenfranchisement was this thing that they could just magically leap over and then at the same time say and yet we're going to fight and we're going to win the odds are against and we're, we're still you know it, yep. it, it is a it is it, it's a remarkable a remarkable ability to hold both of those ideas um, in your head at the same time, to not be naive about the opposition. I think she also, an underappreciated part of the, the, that race she ran in 2018, um, and I think actually, which which is true of Warnock's race too, like, th she's a good politician. She was very disciplined. You know, yeah. she... She yeah, engaged she on the issues she wanted to engage in on, right. which were the issues where she knew she had majority support and she hammered right. those. Right. And Warnock did the same thing. Like, the, you know, it, which is not to say that you you apologize or shy away from or, you know, disavow your, you know, anti-imperialist statements from the pulpit or things like that. Like you got to you, you, you stand for what you stand for. But but. You know, part of politics is focus and what you put focus on <laughs> and what they try to put focus on. And like. Abrams was disciplined in that race. It's why she got so close. Warnock and Ossoff were very disciplined in their races about, you know, healthcare, $2,000 checks. Like, th these are popular things, and these are what we're going to try to deliver for you. And again, it's like, in all of the despair I think we often feel about the state of American democracy, and particularly when you looked at those folks who are, where, where we started the conversation, like, essentially hived off from reality, um, at the margins, persuasion matters, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, no, it does. People are capable of being persuaded. There's not a ton of them. <laughs> and like the way they're persuaded can be pretty weird and kind of gnarly and some often politically problematic. But like you can move people um, with the right focus and arguments. And that, you know, that that is the, the opposite of what we've seen in the in the sort of, you know, the rump minority caucus. But that to me is that that's the thing that I want to talk to you about too, is like, I almost don't want to say this cause I don't want to call it into being, but watching yesterday and then connecting it to what we saw in the Michigan state house when they walked into the Capitol with their long guns, I fear that we are watching the birth of a template for what essentially armed QAnon inflected tea party movements will look like now. Like armed intimidation of elected office holders as a tool of American politics, essentially. You know, again, I think because of the haze of uh, what 
the way we, we see this country, it's, it's very hard for people to grapple with the idea that not only has this been a minoritarian uh, movement, it's been a violent movement. Um, and this is kind of why, and I don't, I don't know when this is going to get broadcast, but this is kind of why I really feel like no matter what, Congress has to, has to act. Like, they, they really, really have to act. Agreed. Um, because uh, I am not particularly confident um, in, in prosecutions and what, and what that's going to bring, you know, in terms of what happened yesterday. Um, but I, the danger, as far as I am concerned, is not simply that someone will try this, you know, again at the Capitol. They, they might well, by the way. Um, it's all those state houses, man. You yep. know what I mean? Like, like yep. this, this actually happened in Michigan over the summer. They shut yep. down the legislature. That, that happened. So they really, I mean, even before the, you know, the kidnapping plot, you, you know, went, I, I just, again, I don't know how you tell a group of well-armed people that they have been victimized and will be, you know, by the time, you know, the Biden presidency ends for a decade and a half plus that it's being, and they do nothing. Like what, <laughs> what is the expectation for that? You know, why, why, why would that be true? How can this not end up in some sort of violence? And, and, I, and I, you know, I, I respect, you know, what you're saying in terms of, you know, not wanting to call it into being. Um, but, you know, I just think it would be wrong to be naive about that. You yeah. Know? And I mean, you're, you're not the one calling it into being. Right. No, you know it's I mean? just it's 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 more like the thing that that really. The thing I've been really focused on, I, I, the, the Michigan, that Michigan that Michigan moment was really important, I think, because, you know, I said this, I think, I don't know where I said it on the show or on Twitter, but like, if I show up at your door and I ring your doorbell, okay, and I'm a neighbor who's got a problem with you, your fence is broken or you're, and I, and you open the door and I'm there and I'm like, hey, look, now that's one thing. Now, if I do that and you open the door and I have an AR-15. Mm-hmm. Like, we're just having a completely different interaction. <laughs> I mean, right. no one can deny that. It, right. it, it just, those don't, that's not a difference in right. degree. That's a difference in kind. kind. Like, yeah. we're, we're, that's not like, we're, we just have, those are two different universes where I ring your doorbell and say, you need to fix your fence. And I ring your doorbell with my AR-15 and say, you need to fix your fence. That's right. And I just feel like we have slipped into the ladder in a lot of these places. So when the, when those folks show up with their guns and they stand holding guns, looking down from the gallery in the Michigan State House, like mm. that that is the I think I, I'm I'm stealing this from someone. That is, but that is the Second Amendment cannibalizing the first. Right. Like right. at that point, the question of what peaceable assembly is really becomes murky because. If you're showing up armed, the, the the threat of violence just hangs over all of it. And, like, that's what we saw yesterday, dude, because, honestly, part of the reason when people say compare the way they treated, you know, the, the, the folks yesterday versus, say, a BLM protest, there's a lot of reasons for that. Sympathies of law enforcement, you know, and their politics, race. One of the things, though, is that, like, those Capitol Police knew those people were carrying Right. 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 <laughs> and by and large, that's not the case at George Floyd protests. Right. And so right. if you come in wielding your batons and pushing people around tear gassing, you're not going to get shot. But they knew what they were dealing with yesterday. Like once they got past the barriers and they're roaming around, mm-hmm. you got to assume everyone's caring. And like it just puts things in such a different space from like a democratic perspective when you add guns to like organize political action. Right. No, no, I I, I, I totally agree. You know, I, I want to just broaden this out a little bit because I have a question, you know, sort of for you. And I, I know I text you about this all the time. Um, just permit me to go, uh, you know, a bit of field here. Please. Um, <clears throat> you know, the other thing, Chris, you know, because we had this opportunity to do this, that, you know, when I watch your show every night that I feel like you have been deservedly passionate about, passionate about is, is uh, covid um, I was going to text you the other day and say, man, you got to write a COVID book. <laughs> I just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, because I think you've been clear about that. And um, when, when I think about yesterday um, and I think about this summer of protests um, and I think about how, you know, w- what the police response was in that case. 
Um, and I think about what the police response was, obviously, to the protests over the summer. And I think about how the events of this summer are still going on. Uh, when I think about uh, Chicago, yep. uh, where the mayor was just found to have <laughs> covered up this tape, um, where they no knocked you know, on the door of this woman and left her nude, I believe, for like 90 minutes or something crazy like that. Um, when I you know, think about uh, Rahm Emanuel before that, um, who, you know, obviously, you know, uh, covered up the killing of, of, of a child and was being considered. Uh, it, it felt like the left had to, you know, you know, basically marshal all they had to keep him out of the cabinet. I don't know why people who it is that absolutely loves Rahm and what makes Rahm essential, but apparently he was. Um, and, and covering up the murder of a child was not enough. And I think about how some of these politicians have, you know, been traveling um, during this period of COVID. And I want to ask you a broader question about the kind of leadership class we have and whether you've been thinking about that. And I'm saying this obviously in reference to, you know, Twilight of the Elites, which I think about all the time, all the time, um, because on some level and, you know, the place to focus on for yesterday, by the way, obviously, is the Republican Party of leadership like this. Like what? Josh, Josh Hawley is an Ivy League dude, right? Um, or as Stanford League, dude, me as as Ivy League as they come. We Stanford and then Yale Law and a fancy fellowship. But and, and what is British Ted Cruz? Ted Cruz is what school. a Harvard Law dude or something like he that. He is Princeton Harvard Law. He's Princeton okay. Harvard Law Supreme Court clerkship. Josh Hawley is Stanford Yale Law Supreme Court clerkship. Boy, oh boy! I just wonder what you think about whether you have insights on our leadership class right now, especially in light of you know Twilight of the Elites. That is a that's a great question. I'm gonna and I'm gonna give you my answer right after we take this quick break. So you were, you're asking about the sort of the leadership class. And I, I you like, you know, I think you and I first had this text exchange when the, like the Gavin Newsom thing was, and then it was like, Oh no, it was Deborah Burks. Right. It was right, like right. Deborah Burks had, there was like 12 people at her family holiday thing. And it's like, <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you people? But it was on the heels of Gavin Newsom. Like, that's what I like, had in it mind, just like, all those other ones. And, like, yeah. I just, I mean, first of all, just at one level, like, for myself, <laughs> I think that, like, my own, I have, like, a certain amount of, like, moral vanity and narcissism, which I don't think is a particularly elevated thing, is actually kind of a little skeezy, but ends up checking behavior like that. <laughs> Because I would be so embarrassed. That's right. <laughs> my, my own self-regard would be so punctured <laughs> if I was ever busted on something like right. that, that right. it like keeps me in check. It's like, of course, we're like, but I do think I, I, I go back and forth about the degree to which the leadership, whoever you want to call it, like the folks that have power in our society is and their deficiencies, which I think are quite profound are the product of our institutions or mm. a reflection of democratic society or just the way it always has been mm. like people get, you know, that, that, that people are very flawed. People's in positions of power aren't actually that different from other people and other people are flawed and people are messed up and hypocritical and lie to themselves and, and things like that. But I do think here, here's where I do think there's something that, that is true and we touched on this in an earlier conversation, and this is part of the theme of Twilight Elites. There is one system in American life that produces, basically produces people with power. Mm -hmm. And that's the, you know, what we call the meritocracy. Now, there are ways around that. Like, it's one of the things I think I find most fascinating about, for instance, LeBron James. Right. Like LeBron James is just a freaking fascinating and brilliant human being independent of the fact that he is an incredible athlete. And part of what makes him so interesting to me is he is a person with tremendous amounts of wealth, power, vision that who achieved those completely outside of all those institutions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but everyone else from Josh Hawley to Gavin Newt, like to me, you know, I, you know, I, I'm a product of it too. Like, we don't have, and, and I think it, it gets at part of the resentments of the right, frankly, like <laughs> there's not ways, I mean, the promise of democracy is that we all, that like the people rule and that we all have like a say in what we do, but we have a very stratified society and a pretty inbred elite class 
that is produced by the same core set of institutions, even when they have like wildly different worldviews and politics. And the vast majority of people are on the outside of that. And there's something deeply inegalitarian of that. And in the tension between those two, there's we, we haven't resolved it. And I think a lot of resentment builds up. And I think a lot of elite failure builds up. <laughs> right. um, at the same time, people will argue that, like, be careful what you wish were with more democracy. Like, it used to be the case that parties are much more closed off and they would make their choices for nominees behind closed doors. And then we opened that up to democratic input. And now we have primaries that produce Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> like, but see, I would, uh, you know, I would take that back to the minoritarian argument. I don't think more democracy is actually the problem, right? If we had a straight up or down vote, our politics would look very different. You know? Um, that's true. It, yes. You know, um, that's right. The, 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 the politics, actually, the politics of voting ends up empowering vanguard small movements right. in, a, in a million different ways. And, dude, this is true. I mean, this is a place where I think there's real this is actually something I think that's a real problem on the left right now. And I think is one of the things that's promising yeah. about, you know, AOC and the Justice Dems and even the D DSA is that, like, you know, to, one party rule is bad. It's just bad. Like, right. You need competition. I mean, right. to me, the ultimate example is the ANC, like in South Africa, which obviously one of the like great successful moral movements in recent American history um, and is, you know, pretty corrupt and moribund right. Right. <laughs> after decades of essentially one party rule. Right. So you need competition for all, any of this to work. And look, there's ton, like so many Democratic seats are not competitive. They're not challenged. They don't have to fight for those votes. You know, they don't have to work for it. And you see this in a lot of the governing failures in, you know, very liberal blue cities where there's essentially, there's no organized opposition. Now, you don't want an organized, like, Republican Party opposition because, you know, the Republican Party is essentially useless. <laughs> but there's got to, you need competition and like, there's just huge parts of our politics. It's it's a weird thing I think that's happening around polarization, which is the more you polarize, if you polarize and you have a two party system, then you end up with just like a balkanized universe of one party states. You know, the reason why, I, like, I think about this, and it's like, um, so I like, I like again, I you know, I think the road to yesterday began and probably began before this, but if I had to choose something in the immediate present, you know, I I, I think it began with birtherism, right? Yeah. Um, like, I think the acceptance of that you know, uh, led, you know, in, inexorably to, you know, wh where we ended up. Um, and one of the alarming things to me, A, you know, was the fact actually that the Republican Party took it, you know, so seriously um, and, you know, really made very, very little efforts to, to, to tamp it down. And when they did, it was these kind of, you know, well, I don't believe this, but, you know, it really would help if Obama would, you know what I mean? Those, those, those sorts of, you know, uh, uh, humoring responses. Um, but man, I don't know that Democrats themselves took it destruct took its destructive power seriously. Um, and I, I think again, you know, this goes back to that that haze. So what I'm saying is like, I don't know that the leadership class itself understood how, how bad allowing an open lie to take seat in the majority of an opposition party. Right. Um, like how bad that was, because, you know, what you have to imagine is, uh, you know, imagine, you know, you just talking about LeBron. Imagine uh, uh, the Lakers facing off against the Heat last year and the Heat just say, no call unless it favors us is legitimate. Right. You know, now, now look, calls are contested all the time. People fight, people get mad at refs, yeah. da, da 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 But there's a reason why if you touch a ref, you get automatically object, you know, ejected you know, from the game. Yep. No ifs, ands, or buts about There has to be something uniform. Correct. You know what I mean? A place where you guys agree. And so, you know, I, I don't know if um, media is necessarily that, but what I'm, what I'm saying is once people commit, yep. you know, to wholly to superstition, yep. what, is, what is the grounds? You know, for 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 non for the kind of nonviolent governance that you know we we hope to have. That um, I, that is the question. I mean, I think that's that is the that is the crisis beneath all the other crises because if you have you know thirty five or forty percent of a population that's sort of 
yeah, hermetically sealed off and thinks that it's all, you know, rigged and a conspiracy and fake news. <laughs> like, I, I just what democratic governance looks like under those conditions. I mean, that we, we are living the experiment. I mean, it looks we like are. Donald Trump. I mean, the answer is, what does democratic governance look like under those conditions? And the answer is, yesterday at the Capitol, with the guy in the fur hat, topless, with the Norse slash fascist tattoos, sitting in the seat that was occupied by the vice president an hour before, before he had to be evacuated. Or the guy walking through statue or, you know, hall with the flag of, you know, insurrection and traitors. Yes. You know, Man, just, that just, image, just I mean, I was like, through. that was just the most perfect thing I've ever seen. It really was. It just really like, was. There he is. There he is. Like someone truly representing that flag for what right. it stands for. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Giving that flag its proper and appropriate meaning. That's right. That's right. And, and Chris, this is why, you know, for me, um, I just I don't think this ends. You know, with the kind of broad, you yep. know, condemnation. You know, I, yep. I, you know, I saw you yesterday kind of going off, and you know, totally in agreements with you, because I, I, I don't think this just ends tomorrow. See, the, the problem is, whatever you know, law enforcement does, you know, whatever um, impeachment or not impeachment happens, those folks are still out there. I mean, there are a lot of people who are predicting doom for Josh Hawley. Now, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I mean, either. I, I'm, I'm not so sure. I mean, that constituency is still there. You know, um, and as long as there and as there are people who, you know, feel it's fine, you know, to feed it, you know, and, and, and to feed it. I mean, I, I just I, I try to imagine, for instance. Responsible, quote unquote, black leadership going out right now and saying, yeah, the vaccine is poison. You're right. This is another Tuskegee experiment. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like, yeah. like that would be so. Yeah. Like destructive. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Great, like it would that be is a so great that is a great suicidal example. You know? Um and, and it's not that there aren't elements like that in the black community. Of course they are. No, we I mean but that's not to elect course, them to, you know, House of Representatives though. That's you know a, I mean? well that's such a that is a great example that nails some of the asymmetries because it's like, of course that stuff exists. That like that sentiment exists. It it there are various you can find it in lots of places. It percolates because both based on very good historical right. reason and right. also like a universal allure of conspiracy and that we all, you know, that, that, that exists in all societies at all times. Like that's, there, there's something universal about that. We want to make sense of the world. Um, sometimes, you know, we, we come up with theories that, that, that make the world make sense, even if they're, they're, they're not connected to reality. And that's, a I think, a pretty universal human impulse. But this question of what the leaders do or what gatekeepers do and that like and the, the you know the example that i've always given is is 911 truth because like that's the one i, I talk mm -hmm. about it on the podcast all the time because that was the one i lived through which where it was like i was part of the left at a moment when that was a very powerful rising movement and people had to actively dismantle and ostracize it like the, you had to have the fight right and be like no get the fuck out of our event <laughs> like, no, don't sell your, don't sell your inside job books here because, right, right. <laughs> because that's false because that's, right. it's that, because it's false. It's not true. And like that, and you know, and you were called a sellout or, a, you know, whatever you were right. called, but like that stuff matters. And so if you just give in, I mean, yeah, imagine, Imagine if the Democratic leadership in the days after 9-11 was like Bush knocked down the towers. Right. <laughs> right. If just one party was like, oh, this was clearly an inside job by George W. Right. Bush. Right. Like, right. what would you do? What would the country do? Like, how could, right. you know? Right. So, it, yeah, like that, that question of what do you do when the people... And I thought actually that was... I don't know if you saw it, but like, I actually thought this was a great Mitt Romney moment yesterday. Where Mitt Romney just said, it's such an obvious point, but he just said, basically he's talking to Holly and Cruz and they want to say that you, you know, that you would say that we're not respecting uh, the tens of millions of people who believe this. The way to respect those people is to tell them the tell truth. Them the truth. Tell them the truth. <laughs> it doesn't show them respect to condescend to the lies they've been fed. 
it shows them respect by saying that's not true. Like, it was a really good moment. (laughs) Yeah, no, it was. It was. You know, the other thing I wanted to ask you, I know this is your podcast, but it's a secret Please. agenda. Um, what does 2022 and 2024 look like to you? Um, because I have all of these, like, dark ideas floating in, in, in my head. Like, you know, Mitch McConnell was being saluted, you know, for his statesmanship yesterday. And I was just like, I mean, maybe, maybe, Oof, but no, no. actually what he probably understands is like, what, what the fuck? Why am I going for the Hail Mary? <laughs> Yeah, you know what I mean. When when I'm up, like why why would I do that? You know what I mean. Why would the, I do that? I you thought know? Alex Alex Perrine had an amazing tweet that was like his gloss of the McConnell speech. He said McConnell's speech was saying the the right way to steal an election is to put together an argument you can get conservative justices to buy, right. and and if you fail at that, then you're just doing dumb stunts like the Democrats do. Right, 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 <laughs> that, right, right. Like that was basically what that speech was. Yeah. Like, yeah, this is a, at Holly. Like, I'll show you how to steal an election. Exactly. Like, this is a pathetic spectacle. <laughs> like the kind of thing that like impotent Democrats do. Right. You idiots. Right. Um, right. No, I mean, I, I don't. I really don't know. I, I'm worried about it. Obviously, I'm. I'm very worried about the future. I mean, I don't. I feel really. I mean, part of I think that you were referencing what I said on air last night. Like. I feel like there's just a miss. I think there is a, I I totally understand the impulse towards normalcy, both as a kind of comfort and also as a kind of like, you can will it into being by asserting it kind of. And I get that. I get that there are a lot of people, I think, making a calculation in, in positions of power in the Democratic Party that like, you want to marginalize this and not lend it more credence and you want to sort of through a kind of sheer will push the institutions back into working, push us back towards democratic normalcy. But I also think there's just something so like disconnected from reality about that and dangerous. And I just, yeah, I'm really worried about the next few years. I'm just really worried. Now, again, who knows? Like there are so many, there's just so many unknowns and I'll I'll leave with this one thought. Which, which is a tease to a piece I think that's going to be out in the Atlantic soon, which wrote up some of my thoughts post-election. A thing that I think is kind of happening in a fascinating way is that the Republican Party is so obsessed. That coalition is so obsessed with the question of who rules, who controls power. They care less and less about what the agenda is. Mm. So I actually see a world in which the Republican Party weirdly starts to moderate on policy because it doesn't matter to them. It matters who rules and everything else is just they don't care. So it's like to me, the Josh Hawley standing up there in a week, pounding the table for two thousand dollar checks and pounding the table for overturning the will of the people in the same breath. Is like a perfect encapsulation of it. So like, I will offer just a little pushback on that. I think they legitimately care. I think, and this goes, you know, to your question of who rules. Um, I think they legitimately care about disenfranchising black people. Oh no, totally. I agree with that. I, I, I think, I think the things they care about when I say like radicalizing against democracy, right. mm-hmm. I think the things mm-hmm. they won't that they will be more extreme on is enfranchisement, the voting, voting integrity, all that stuff. What I mean more is like all the. Paul Ryan, Reagan, Romney, Ryan, the budget, we're going to fix, we're going to Don't you think they care about tax cuts? Don't you think it's a significant, they actually care about that? I only think the donor class does. But that's a powerful element. Oh, no, Party, it's a powerful right? element. I just think that, like, I think those people that overran the Capitol yesterday and increasingly the mass base of the party yeah, right, right, could right. give a shit about yeah, any of it. Care. Yeah, Like, right. and in right. fact, I think probably want $2,000 checks and, like, don't, like... I just think that that aspect, because the mass base has gotten so detached from whatever, like, they used to tell themselves Reaganite conservatism was, that there's tremendous space for policy entrepreneurship where you can be like, $2,000 checks to every American is the real conservative thing. And they'll be like, sure. I even think, honestly, I think, like, I was fascinated by how, you know, Donald Trump on, like, kept, you know, hammering his criminal justice reform, which in the grand scheme of things was tiny. But, like, 
I even think there there is space there on things like that. I think the thing that they're going to not compromise, to, to your point, is like voter enfranchisement allowing they are going to get worse and worse, more radical and more anti-democratic. Even if whatever the substance of the agenda when they get to control things is more wide open in some ways than I think it has been in a while. Well, of course, the flip side of that, though, um, if we you know go back to our past, is there has always been a constituency in this country for her invoked democracy. Exactly. Yes. You know, um, and so, and that's the Josh Hawley. There you go. That's right. Th- that is that yeah. is what he's pushing. Right. Right. And so you get yeah policy, but you know maybe you write it in such a way um, that at the state level, folks can cut out who they want to cut out. You know. Um, that's not the case with these two thousand dollar checks, but you know, if we, you know, looking forward, I, you know, I want to because I, I sent you on that pessimistic note. You know, one thing I do want to highlight is because um, I, don't, I don't want it just to be this. There's a great opportunity over the next two years. There really, really is. You know, I, I, I know um, there probably isn't much appetite for this in the Biden um, White House, but goddamn, DC statehood, man, DC statehood. You know, um, the way to fight this is more power. You know, I um, could not agree more, and it should be just make DC a state, right. do it. Like, right. I, and I think there's appetite for it. I think there's maybe the votes for it. Like, you think um, there is appetite for it? There's definitely appetite for it. The question is that there are votes for it. But I, yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And again, like, I think think thinking creatively about power, which is what part of that is, is is going to be key for basically everyone. Like. You have to, we have to be thinking about ways to strengthen and enlarge American democracy <laughs> because that's upstream of everything else. And that's the threat right now that we saw when the mob overran the Capitol because they didn't want the will of the majority of Americans to, to become the governing party. <laughs> All right. Ta-Nehisi Coates, um, what, what is your next – I mean – People should read. Let me just. I'll, I will give a plug for the Water Dancer, which is an incredible book. Which is Tanahasi's first novel. Thank you, Chris. Thank which you. I got to read in advance and loved, and then I gave to Kate, and she read and loved. Um, it was great too because I, I don't read enough fiction, so I was glad to uh, have an opportunity. Um, what What are you working on these days? Uh, the, the screenplay adaptation to that. I did. Uh, well, I guess I'm, I don't know how the hell this happened, but somehow I become a screenwriter. Um, I love it. Hopefully not for much longer, man. I really miss books, and I can't wait to get back to them. Um, screenwriting is a much more collaborative exercise. I miss the selfishness of books. Um, I, you know, I'm enjoying any time I'm creating, but um, I don't know. Anyway, uh, there, there was um, uh, some time ago. Uh, you know, I signed up for an adaptation of um, Wrong Answer, which was this New Yorker story about the Atlanta teacher scandal. Yeah, incredible story. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will say this. I will say this. And I think you and I have talked about um, this before. There is something um, a lot more rewarding about, say, dealing with my thoughts about charter schools and, you know, uh, what's happened, you know, in terms of public schools and what the politics of that have been through a screenplay. Totally. As opposed to, you know, a, a, you know not even a tweet storm, but writing out a, a non-fictive, you know, argument. Yep. Um, there's something about getting into the minds of the actual people who are dealing with this, the kids that are actually there, that is deeply, deeply pleasing. Yeah, and I also think this is true of, like, I think about Tony Kushner, who's a huge hero of mine as a writer, where it's like, fictional worlds allow you to layer in a level of complexity and 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 contrasting ideas exactly. holding them together in your head in a way that is harder in nonfiction. Um, that I, I'm, I'm working on a screenplay for a pilot right now with a friend, which I've been working on for years, but it's, it's, I, I find the same thing because it's, it's about a topic that's ostensibly, it is political, but, but allows for like a whole bunch of layers that I find pretty rewarding. Yeah. And it's, uh, you just have, a um, I don't know, man. I think like what, what, I, what I've been dealing with over, like even yesterday, you know, people were like, okay, are you going to write something? You're going to write something. And it's like, I really don't know what to say beyond the obvious. Yeah, dude, like, welcome to my world. What to write beyond. I've been I mean, saying the same goddamn thing yeah, every night for I mean, an hour, good God, good five God. nights a week. I mean, good particularly God. with COVID, I just go on. I'm like, right. what are we doing here, people? Right, right. You guys know what I think. You know, Why are we letting people you know, die? Like, yeah. but you yeah. know, yeah, that, no, I believe me, I'm, 
I'm submit that. All right. Well, I, I'm I'm excited about that project and and anything else you have and come back come back soon and maybe we'll let's let's get when we're both vaccinated we'll get dinner. Definitely, definitely. Thanks so much, Chris. Once again, my great thanks to my friend Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, you can always check out his work in any bookstore or book ordering website in America. Between the World and Me, uh, which is his uh, extremely brilliant, amazing, I think sort of instant classic and acclaimed open letter to his son. Uh, we were eight years in power, a collection of his essays, The Water Dancer. You can also watch the Between the World and Me uh, adaptation on HBO. And I guess The Water Dancer is coming to uh, movies at some point. So check it out. He's not on Twitter because he's wise, wiser than the rest of us. <laughs> so he just, he does his writing, he goes offline and then he comes back into the world of uh, digital insanity. And then he, he moves away from it very, very smartly. Um, send us feedback, a hashtag with pod, email with pod at gmail.com. Wise is Happenings presented by MSNBC and NBC News, produced by the All In Team and features music by Eddie Cooper. You can see more of our work, including links to things we mentioned here by going to nbcnews.com slash wise is happening. 